So welcome to Berkeley Lab Careers in STEM Talks. This is our opportunity to showcase different careers in STEM with Berkeley Lab colleagues, as well as friends and colleagues from all over the country. My name is Faith Dukes, and I manage K-12 outreach and education programs as a part of our government and community relations office here at Berkeley Lab. For those of you just joining us for the first time, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory is one of 17 Department of Energy National Laboratories. We are located in Berkeley, California. Berkeley Lab has been recognized for its leadership in innovative research for close to 90 years. As of 2020, the lab has been recognized with 14 Nobel Prizes and credited with the discovery of 16 elements on the periodic table. We are extremely excited to continue talking about the work of researchers and staff here at the lab and with our colleagues who are also in different STEM fields uh, with these bi-weekly career talks. These have included conversations about scientists using artwork to communicate science and those who are protecting our data through privacy and security. Today, we continue those discussions with our researchers and educators who are not only wear laboratory coats, they also wear hiking boots and hard hats. These are scientists explore the world, thinking about our planet, how we can better understand it and take care of it. So without further ado, I'm going to allow our four panelists to introduce themselves, talk a little bit about their career trajectory, and then we'll get into a discussion about the things that make them successful. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat box. We are also recording this to share with future uh, students. And I'd like for our first speaker to start his camera. So Jeff White, who's the owner and operator of Archaeology Can You Dig It, um, will be talking about his work as well as introducing you to his um, field work and his organization. So Jeff, thanks for joining us. So good morning, everybody. And uh, first of all, thank you to UC Berkeley and everybody on the panel. I'm ecstatic to be here and it's uh, made my day to be a part of this. So like what, what was said before by faith, my name is Jeff White. I am a archeologist. I worked in the field for a total of about 16 plus years. I've worked in a lot of museums doing science and STEM as well. But my passion after I worked in the field over that time period, actually even before I started that, was to start this business called Archaeology Can You Dig It? And I'll get a little bit more into that in my next slide, my next two slides. And on the next slide, you'll see a little bit about career trajectories and inspirations. So I'll talk a little bit about that for myself. Uh, going into this, I wanted to travel the country working on different archaeological sites, just not necessarily just being pigeonholed in one area like Ohio. I wanted to experience all of the country. Um, all of the different sites are different, different, you know, prehistoric sites, which is before the written word, then the historic sites, which are considered after the written word. So I wanted to kind of make sense of all that and kind of put everything together as opposed to like uh, basically just focusing on one area of archaeology. Uh, also, I wanted to work in an archaeological lab examining artifacts and again, museum work. So any good uh, archaeologist is going to have experience working in the field as well as working in the lab. Because when you find these artifacts in the field, it's not just to put them on, I'm going to date myself, not to just put them on eBay, but it's to make sense of these artifacts, research who was living there, what they were doing with these artifacts, and why they left them about. Um, we are glorified trash diggers. So honestly, if I was to look through any of your trash right now, I would know pretty much everything about you, what you ate, what you wore, what toys you threw away. So that's what we do. We find people's um, material and then we make sense of it to figure out the puzzle of how they were living. As far as museum work, I've had some good experiences working at, I worked at Coastside here in Columbus. I worked at Fort Ancient Archaeological Park. I worked for Boonshaw Museum of Discovery, our two locations. Um, so I, I learned a lot there working in the education department, science theaters, putting on uh, experiments and whatnot. So with my business, I sort of used archaeology and STEM and combine that together like chemistry demonstrations, as well as archaeology, anthropology. And I gained that from working at a few different uh, museums in my past. Uh, for the last, create an archaeological outreach youth program to educate kids. So this was really important to me. Um, I went to my field school for archaeology was in 2003. For us, that's like a college internship. You cannot graduate with a degree in archaeology, anthropology, unless you complete a field school. So ours at the time was the longest in the country. It was 13 weeks. 
But at that time, you know, anthropology is the study of everyone's culture and ethnicity. I don't like to use the word race. I use ethnicity because in my opinion, there's only one race. There's the human race. So everyone's ethnicity and heritage is important. And anthropology and archaeology is supposed to be the way to do that. Uh, but for myself in 2004 is when I finished up over there, they, I was the first individual to finish with, with an archaeology degree, not anthropology, but specializing in archaeology. And to me, that's not really a badge of honor. I wanted to, it's, it's to benefit the whole culture and get everyone involved. So because I was one of a few, I decided to create this hands-on archaeological outreach program called Archaeology Can You Dig It? And on the next slide, you'll see a few pictures. And I'll just run through these real quick. I don't want to take all the time up before we get to the questions. Uh, so I, I have some pictures that are focusing on field work, uh, lab work, and also archaeology. Can you dig it? So the top left picture, I think we were in Pennsylvania working on a cemetery out there. And this is a real cool picture that sort of sums up field work. Um, it was a very, it was a long day, but a beautiful scenery is what we are always used to experiencing. And another person on our crew captured that picture. So I just wanted to put that in to encourage you to be an archaeologist. All right, the second picture to the right is a basically a prehistoric cooking oven, basically. Um, so it was found in Sile, Ohio. We also found a Clovis point broken on that uh, site as well. It was out of context, not in where we were actually excavating, but Clovis points are some of the oldest points in the country. They are from Clovis, New Mexico, uh, very, very old projectile points. In the bag in there, you can see it's full of charcoal and all that red staining is filled with FCR, fire crack rock, where they were literally prehistoric people who were cooking and it got so hot that it left that stain in the ground, which is also called a midden. All right, to the right is a cemetery that we were working in. I wanna say it was also in Pennsylvania. Sometimes when erosion occurs, we have to actually remove um, human remains out of the cemetery to move them somewhere else if they're going to be damaged. Um, so that was a cool site. There was a lady there with a headstone named Martha. I remember her to this day. And uh, I used to talk to her and my friends laughed at me, but, but that was sort of my buddy, her headstone. We were working near her headstone. And I'll wrap it up really quickly. To the bottom left, you'll see lab work. Um, I've done a lot of lab work. That's just sort of, that was just pretty simple. We were, basically I was just washing artifacts and cataloging them, putting them in the bags, making sure that they were in the areas they were supposed to be. And then we move on and do some more things with those artifacts as well. So the kids that you see down there looking at the artifacts, that is a wonderful school in Yellow Springs, Ohio called Antioch. And I was teaching them, I had a residency there for, the first one was a 13 days and I had another one for a week. So I just literally taught them all about archeology span hands-on, different STEM experiments. We excavated out in their yards as well. And last but not least is another school here called Columbus Academy. Um, so that was a, I do a lot of after school programs as well for kids. That, that camp, we didn't have a whole lot in this particular uh, after school program, but the kids were great. So what they're doing now is throwing a tool called an atlatl. It is a spear and it was developed by the Aztecs and it was also used by the prehistoric American Indians here. A projectile point would be on the end and it's very accurate. It came um, before the bow and arrow and after the thrusting, after the thrusting spear. So that's about it for me for now. Thank you, Jeff. We look forward to talking with you more about your work. Okay. Our next presenter will be Robin Lopez, who is a research associate at Berkeley Lab, as well as a PhD scholar at UC Berkeley. So Robin, please tell us about your work and your career. Yeah, thank you, uh, Faith, for the introduction. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, You'll uh, get a sense of my career trajectory. And also before I proceed, if uh, any of you are on social media, my Instagram, Twitter handles at the bottom left, at Richmond Life. Um, I, it looks like I acting got muted there. Um, so uh, I, I was just saying uh, really quickly, if anyone wants to connect with me on social media, my uh, Instagram, Twitter handles at the bottom left, Richmond Life. Um, my Career trajectory, um, it's more or less a uh, unique transition. So in the early 2000s, uh, if you look at that uh, first photo on the left, uh, that was me in my much younger days. Uh, 
And I had actually barely graduated high school. I dropped out of college uh, several times. Uh, but uh, despite all that, I knew I had some sense of curiosity and creativity, but I just, I lacked that mentorship and that representation. And when I say representation, I mean, having people who look like me or who resonate with my identity that allows me to project myself into those spaces. Um, it wasn't until uh, the 2010, I don't know if that's the correct way to uh, phrase it, but the 2010, uh, that's when things uh, changed slightly for me. Um, I started taking college seriously. I went back to community college at a local institution nearby called Contra Costa College. And from there, I was uh, exposed to opportunity to internship. And that led to interning with the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab through the US Department of Energy uh, Community College Internship Program. And from there, it just took off. I was exposed to stellar mentorship and guidance, exactly what uh, I needed and exactly what many other folks need uh, in any career trajectory, regardless of what they study. Um, but through that, I was able to have access and opportunity to solve some of these most, some of these more complex problems and have an opportunity to travel. It's uh, taken me to Alaska. It's taken me a mile deep underground in South Dakota. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stories about uh, the travels I've, I've had to take. Uh, one of which, uh, once getting stuck in the snow and calling my, one of my mentors at like four in the morning, uh, West Coast time, trying to figure out what to do because that was my first time driving in the snow. Um, but I think that just speaks to the volume, the level of uh, mentorship when people can be there for you in the strangest of times and needs. But uh, currently uh, in the 2020, uh, as I say, it's getting real in the field. Um, I do a lot of field and lab work uh, to catalyze change as a PhD researcher. I'm currently in my third year at UC Berkeley in environmental science policy and management. And I'm hoping just to uh, increase the representation of uh, scholars of all different backgrounds and identities and make sure we all have a collective voice at that table. And if we go to the next slide, uh, I could give examples of what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. I like to refer to the to science for the community, similar to what the previous speaker Jeff was uh, speaking on. Um, the first photo on the left uh, highlights some of my work in soil science. Uh, I always use this phrase, staying loyal to the soil and acknowledge uh, the intersectionality that our roots, they run deep and they can tell us a lot about the natural world. And that's just something I find phenomenal about soils and uh, the ability for soil to give us insight on history and future. Um, as well as some of my work deals with the concept of uh, work surrounding eco-hydrology. Uh, specifically right now, I have a freshwater ecology project and trying to understand the movement of fish migration and survival in uh, the Western US along uh, rivers and streams. And that said, uh, water is essential and it interacts with soil to support life of all forms, not just human life. And similar to, again, what the previous speaker Jeff had mentioned, outreach is a major component for me, because as I said, representation matters and that equity and access to field work and the science, that is equally essential to the actual work that we do. Uh, with that uh, all said, I'll close it out for now and pass it over back to Faith. All right, thanks Robin and thanks for joining us today. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Rob Crystal Arnelas. He is a postdoctoral scholar here at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So Rob, tell us about your work. Thanks Faith and uh, hi everyone. Um, so excited to be part of this panel. Um, so, uh, as Faith said, I'm a postdoctoral scholar at Berkeley Lab, which means I finished up um, finished up grad school, finished my PhD uh, about a year ago, and now I'm starting off at a researcher um, up at the lab in the uh, geoscience and earth science division up, up there. And uh, here's a well, I, I like to start off with a nice picture of a of a field site, and um, yeah, we can we can head over to the next slide there. Thanks, Faith. Um, <clears throat> so just a little bit about my career path. Um, I grew up in Rhode Island, the smallest state in the US. That's not, not pictured on here, but I like to give uh, the smallest state a little shout out. I, um, 
I went to my get my undergraduate degree at Boston University, um, which uh, I was the uh, first in my family to go to college. And so, you know, didn't go didn't go too far away from home, just an hour away up to up to Boston. So I could still try to see my family regularly and um, and found a lot of uh, like, I guess, happiness and still being close to the family while trying trying something new um, in getting that biology degree at, at BU. Uh, after college, I spent five years working for different community organizations back in my hometown of Providence, Rhode Island. That's the Providence After School Alliance and New Urban Arts pictured there. I taught um, like STEM education and arts education programs to middle schoolers and high schoolers. And I think the threat of education is something I've always been like really interested in. And it was a particular joy to, to like do that in my home, in my hometown. Uh, then I went to Rutgers for graduate school in ecology and evolution. That's in New Jersey. Uh, and I worked with my mentor, Dr. Julie Lockwood. Um, and uh, while at while at Rutgers, I got introduced to um, Gina Ramirez, who talked to me about this program called Clubes de Ciencia, and that brought me on two different summers to teach workshops at um, in Guadalajara in Mexico, uh, teach like ecology based and also some computer programming based workshops for high schoolers there. Um, I have to give a shout out also to the Ecological Society of America, um, which is uh, it's sort of like a society for ecology folks. Um, and they have a really, really strong student group of like thousands of members. And I made a lot of big connections to other, other grad students and undergrads through that organization, the ESA. And then in the past couple of years, I've been adjuncting, um, which is like teaching a statistics course at University of San Francisco and also tutoring in statistics at Santa Rosa Junior College, where I was living um, up in Santa Rosa until I moved down to Berkeley to start at Berkeley Lab uh, in, in July. And then I, I uh, included a picture of my um, one of my other mentors, Dr. Kate Tully, who I've worked with on some some agricultural projects, actually, so some farm farmland projects. Okay, and on the on the next slide, I'll just give you a quick synopsis of what my different work looks like at different stages of my career. Um, in college, I uh, I ended up going to um, Ecuador to um, participate in an ecology uh, semester, a totally ecology based semester. Um, and uh, I studied bats there. And I didn't know I was going to study bats until I kind of showed up. But I met, met a really amazing um, gra uh, person doing research on bats down there named Jaime Guerra. And Jaime showed me kind of like how to, how to work with bats, how to hold them. I did get bitten by a few bats along the way. But that worked out. It, it was OK. I guess it was all part of, part of the park. Um, and then I, I've also done some field work where I studied birds, which is like what uh, has always been a real passion of mine. So you can see me holding holding a, a little hawk there in North Carolina. In graduate school, I also did some field work. You can see me pictured there in the middle in Puerto Rico where I was studying another kind of bird. Um, and then down at the bottom of that slide, I, I, I also did some field work in uh, the Everglades in Florida. Well, I thought I was going to the Everglades pictured there on the left, but the bird I was interested in studying only hung out in parking lots. So I ended up spending that summer uh, hanging out in different like fast food or clothing retail uh, parking lots. Uh, but that was that was a fun, fun way to spend that summer. And then after grad school, I have pictured on the right, well, my time now at the Berkeley lab doing some agriculture research and then me and my students in Clubes de Ciencias, which um, has kept me kind of going out into the field. Here we were doing some snorkeling um, uh, off the off the coast of Mexico. Um, uh, but yeah, that's how I engage with um, like the outdoorsy type of my job now more and more these days. And with that, um, I'll turn it back to you, Faith. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Rob. Um, our final speaker of this morning is Dr. Lisa D. White. She is Director of Education and Outreach at, UC Muse at the UC Museum of Paleontology. And we all said we liked her dinosaur in the background. Um, 
for today. So thank you, Dr. White, for joining us and telling us about your work as well. Great. Well, thank you, Faith, and thank you, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be on this panel with the other scientists. And I'm the Director of Education and Outreach at the Museum of Paleontology at Berkeley. So the T-Rex that you see behind me uh, is our lobby in the Valley Life Sciences Building. So we're more of a research museum uh, than we are a museum that's open to the public. Although when we are able to be back on campus, we do have some displays in the lobby. But as the education director at the museum, there's a whole range of job tasks that I lead. So I'm happy to share some of those with you. I should say that uh, my position at Berkeley, which is I've joined the museum eight years ago, is really a second career for me. Um, I was a professor of geosciences at San Francisco State University for 22 years. So I had a great career there and it's been wonderful to now uh, be leading projects at the museum at Berkeley. And as I will explain on the next slide, so, you know, my journey has been an interesting one and uh, there are aspects of what the other panelists have shared that are common in my background too, which is I didn't know I wanted to be a geoscientist uh, when I was in high school or even my first few years in college. So the first photo that you see there, it says SFSU around 1980. So when I entered uh, San Francisco State and I'm from San Francisco, so went to college in my hometown, I wanted to be the black female Ansel Adams. And the late Ansel Adams was a nature photographer. So he was famous for all these black and white photos of Yosemite and the American West. And I was really captured by the arts and specifically photography. And I thought, well, if I'm gonna be a great, you know, um, landscape or nature photographer, then maybe I should learn something about the landscape. So I took a geology course as an undergrad uh, to uh, satisfy mostly a general education requirement, but I was just taken with the topic. And I was able to get internship experience at the US Geological Survey. So that really set me on a path that included field work travel. They took a group of us to Alaska one year. The next year I was doing field work along the Rio Grande in New Mexico. So I received a lot of mentoring and inspiration. So I went straight to a PhD program after finishing my undergraduate degree at San Francisco State. And so the UCSC photo there from the 80s got the big hair 80s going on. But at that point, you know, I just embraced the opportunity to really showcase the field, you know, fully recognizing, and accepting how rare it is to be an African American woman in earth science but I wanted to make sure I was not the, the last. And so I've taken advantage of opportunities to really put a public face on earth science, whether it's appearing in a Nova production as I did a few years ago, that's actually me in a gold mine um, in the Sierra foothills. And although that's not my specialty, I'm, I'm trained in micro paleontology. All the years I was a professor at San Francisco State University, I taught all across the curriculum and introductory geology to paleontology and oceanography. But a lot of my work has centered around looking at what we call the Monterey Formation. So it's an extensive unit that's 15 to 10 million years old in California. And you find equivalents of that unit around the Pacific Rim. So I've been out on research cruises to Japan, Costa Rica, done field work in the far east of, of Russia to look at units that are equivalent to what we see along the coast here in California. So it's definitely been a journey and uh, I have an extensive network of colleagues that work at museums. I do a lot of work with youth. I was inspired, uh, my work uh, inspired a fifth grader to make um, a mock postage stamp of me. So it was a Black History Month project for that student. Um, and so I just think about what the role models in my life meant to me when it came to seeing success and things you can achieve as a scientist. So I try to do a lot of that in my work. And I will share um, through some of what I do at the museum currently on the next slide um, highlights both uh, some of the titles of projects that I oversee and all the different um, icons and images there 
are just snapshots of some of these projects. And I do get asked a lot, if you're an education director at primarily a research museum, you know, how do you do that education and outreach? And one of the primary ways that we do it is through our web resources. So we've got uh, extensive materials on our websites where individual students, teachers, members of the public, they can really dive into deep earth history. They can learn more about fossils. They can take a virtual field trip. And we're even starting uh, some new directions to projects with uh, what will be a pop-up museum. And so there's a bottom image there where you see a, a trailer uh, looking um, image that, yeah. And so this project that's funded by the National Institutes of Health will help us build an inflatable structure that's about 30 feet in length, but inside this inflatable structure, uh, you will be challenged at solving a viral outbreak of a disease among amphibians, but it'll be escape room style. So one will be provided with clues to try to determine you know, what variant of this virus, how do we uh, develop a serum, and it's just this really fun and engaging way of sharing topics of evolution uh, with our broader audiences. And so this uh, pop-up museum will, will send it around the country. So, th so that's a snapshot. I mentioned, as so have my fellow panelists, the role that field work has played in our education and training and in our careers. And we at the Museum of Paleontology, we love to share that excitement um, with others. So we've got some virtual field trip experiences. Uh, I still intend to go back out in the field when it's safe. And so the ship that you see there uh, is a research vessel that I've been on several times. And now I'm able to go on with teachers and with college students to really try to share what's important about ocean science. And so all along the way, I'm hoping to uh, really invest in opportunities to look at earth science through the lens of diversity by encouraging others to expand the way that we do field work and really uh, embrace a sense of using a uh, place-based knowledge in that. And so we're building that out and also growing community college partnerships through programs that we call Access Paleo or Access Paleontology, where we have virtual labs and paleontology for community college students. So thank you again, and I look forward to uh, some questions. Thank you very much, Dr. White. So I'm going to actually ask my colleague, Edith Lai, to join us. Um, she'll introduce herself, and she'll be answering, asking questions, as well as looking at the chat box. So Edith, if you want to introduce yourself. Uh... Yeah, hi, everyone. So happy everyone could join us today. So I'm Edith, I work with Faith at the K through 12 team in Berkeley Lab. And as she mentioned, I'll also be asking some questions to the panelists that we've prepared as well as asking some questions from the audience. So if everyone would like to start um, compiling their questions in the chat box at any time throughout the session, we can ask those directly to the panelists. Awesome, so now I'll ask everybody to come back on screen and turn their videos on um, since we stopped sharing our slides. And we have a few questions that some people actually put in the Eventbrite uh, registration as well as questions that we started to come up with. Um, but I'd like to start off with um, a question, and this is just a fun one, of what's the, Robin, you talked a little bit about this driving in the snow for the first time, but what's the most unexpected place that you um, were able to go to that you never expected in the, in all of your, you know, days of thinking about field work, where were you able to go? What's the most unexpected place? Just for everybody to answer. Go first since I kind of got called out there. Um, yeah, the so the most unexpected place is exactly where I got stuck in the snow. Um, that was that was really my first time legit being in the snow. Like I've been in the Bay Area all my life. I've been very spoiled and privileged to you know be be in my bubble, and uh, I mean bubble in a multitude of ways, but. When um, I was told, hey, we need you to go to South Dakota uh, for a few weeks to do some field work. 
well, one, I was like, oh, South Dakota, I don't know about that because, you know, I, I hear things. And then uh, they're like, oh, by the way, you're probably going to be underground for 10 hours a day. So you won't see much sunlight. <laughs> I was like, oh, man, like I'm in California. Like all I all I know is sunlight. And so when I went there, um, I tried to uh, put, put my game face on. Um, but it, it was... I guess the best way I can describe it was it, it was wild. Like there's no other way to describe going a mile deep underground to do research. And uh, also having some of your fears demystified about what you think about going to different spaces and places. Um, I think that really helped me um, break a few barriers in terms of uh, interfacing with people from different communities. Um, and, but at the same time, I did deal with some uh, uh, unflattering uh, moments, but those were addressed uh, with my mentors who were there who checked those people at that time. But um, yes, the uh, during that uh, trip and being taken there, uh, that was also my first time driving in the snow. I learned not to trust uh, the GPS after that. It took me up uh, a very steep hill and next thing I know, the truck is sliding backwards. And I'm like, I put the brakes on. And I call my mentor who was in uh, Berkeley at the time. And he's, and he's like, why'd you call me? And I said, well, because you grew up in the snow. I don't know what to do. <laughs> he said, okay, just put that thing in neutral. You're gonna have to let it slide back. I was like, are you sure? He's like, you gotta do what you gotta do. And I, I don't know uh, what was watching over me that time. Uh, the universe must, must have had all full force because not one car got touched. <laughs> but uh, I made it safely to work that day. Awesome. <laughs> Jeff, how about you? What's the most you know unexpected place that you've ended up in for work? Uh, I guess the most unexpected place would be, oh man, let me see. I guess, um, most unexpected place. I, I guess for me, it would be uh, Oklahoma. You know, I, I loved working in Oklahoma. I didn't ever think I would get a chance to work there. Um, for myself, I basically we were there to uh, bound the sites there, like to site boundaries. We knew that there were multiple sites there, but we had to set the boundaries. So basically, we're doing shovel tests on a survey. If you get a double negative in every direction, then you can call it not a site. But if you keep getting positive, a positive means that you have an artifact then you will move on and keep digging holes. And then you move on to like a phase two and then a phase three if there's, you know, a lot of work to be done. But for me, I, I was just um, thoroughly enjoyed Oklahoma. It was very mountainous where we were at. There's a hill at this particular area. We were near Spiral, Ohio, or I'm sorry, Spiral Mound. And uh, so there's a hill there called Cavanaugh Hill. It's the tallest in the country because I think it's one foot shy of a mountain. So we took a trip up there and one night, you know, all of us after we were done working and kind of just took, a, took, took some time out and just relaxed out there and looked all down over the city. But on that particular site for me, it is very reverent. You know, it's not, um, for me, you know, once we found this, we, we sort of said a prayer, like we were very reverent, me and this other individual, but we came across an unmarked burial and, um, in Oklahoma. And at that time, you know, where that was placed, where it was at, was very picturesque anyone would lay their loved one down there. Um, so again, we were, you know, things were done after that, that's, that after that happens, there's a process of things that have to be done to make sure if it wasn't, you know, a crime that was recent, uh, if it's American Indian, then if you have to go through the proper channels and try to find that tribe, find out who it is. So for me, uh, Oklahoma, I did not think I would make it out that far out West doing this. Um, I had made it to Texas before a couple of times, but for Oklahoma, that was probably one of the best uh, days of my life working as an archaeologist that day. Thank you, Jeff. And we always, I think, think of going over to other continents or countries, mm -hmm. but thinking about archaeology in terms of the United States, which is, I guess, a pretty young country. We don't think about that. And so that's really interesting to think about the work that we can do right around us. I'll also have uh, Lisa and then Rob answer this question as well. What's the most unexpected place that you've ended up? Well, there's so many that come to mind. And, uh, you know, during my international travels that included trips to Israel and Egypt when I was in graduate school, and then later trips connected with the shipwork in Japan, Russia, Costa Rica. 
But I'd have to say a trip to Alaska when I was an undergraduate uh, as a field assistant on a US geological survey project was especially unexpected given those times. So I was just so excited, you know, that undergraduate excitement in the major when you get to work with professionals and to be able to go to Alaska to look at these really unique kinds of rocks uh, around Denali National Park. Uh, so the high point um, in the US and in Alaska. And when the organizers of this field trip were explaining to me what to expect, I thought, whoo, nothing much in my urban dwelling life, you know, is gonna really prepare me for one, working at that altitude, you know, two, working with all of the gear that we needed, including rifles, because the summer before we went out, a USGS geologist was mauled by a bear. And so it was mandatory gun training for all geoscience parties at the USGS. So even getting to the field was challenging, like just working up to, you know, being able to work under those conditions, plus the gun training. And I was like, what kind of discipline am I entering? But getting there, the primary transportation was via helicopter. You know, we would get dropped at one point um, and then traverse, collect samples, uh, make measurements all day, and then get picked up uh, on the other end. And there's a part of the field experience that I um, enjoy sharing with people because they didn't provide exactly uh, what not to bring in the field. So, you know, I knew the whole, we had all our gear and, you know, what you would need for um, camping, you know, in cold temperatures, as well as the geological equipment. But um, like many of us, you know, I enjoy having music with me, especially when you know that you're going to be out for a while. And this was at a time where we, there was no digital music players. I mean, if you wanted to have music while you were um, outside, you needed like a cassette player and, you know, a big, it wasn't exactly a boom box, but I had the nerve to like pack in my backpack about 20 cassettes and this portable tape player. And then they were really upset with me, needless to say, because I was supposed to be the one carrying like the last batch of rock samples for that day. And somehow I just got it twisted that we couldn't leave stuff back at the base camp. Like we had to carry all our gear that day. So I got a backpack full of cassette tapes and all, and I'm trying to just be low key about what's in there. So we get to camp at the end of the day, you know, everybody is exhausted, got to set up camp at this high mountain cirque, which is like an ice field. And so I'm trying to get the equipment out to set up camp and like all the cassettes tape just like fell out in front of everybody. So I was busted and then, you know, I got talked about. And so I almost left geology, honestly, after that field season, because I thought, well, clearly I can't be myself, you know, in this. And there are certain expectations about what you don't bring when you're, but it had a happy ending. You see, I'm still in the discipline. Plus like that evening, they were like, well, we might as well listen to music. You know, what did you bring? So I said, aha, see, it was a good thing. I had that. So yeah, just adding a little humor there to what can often be an adventure when we do field work in geoscience. And Rob, I'll let you answer before we switch questions with Edith. Sure, sounds good. Um, so for me, uh, one of the pictures that I showed in my slides was me kind of like on a, on a cliff and some nice blue water behind me in, in Puerto Rico. And on that trip, I, I got, um, it was sort of a, a last minute, I was a last minute addition and I was actually helping out another, another student with their project in Puerto Rico. So just the trip was pretty unexpected for me. I got, yeah, asked to help out um, with someone else's project, but I was like early on in my graduate studies and the trip was to Puerto Rico and it was during December and there was nice warm weather down there. So on all those things, I was like, yes, amazing. I was so excited. Um, and then we spent about two weeks down there looking for this, this one particular bird and we could not find it. We didn't see it the whole time. And it was sort of this thing where we could have been, we could have been maybe a little bit like sad or upset or, or something like that. But in, in reality, like 
we made the most of it. We found other bird species that our, you know, mentors were interested in studying and we were interested in studying. And so we, we really did like um, kind of just see the sites that we could, like take the pictures that you saw in the presentation um, and, and work hard to find this one bird that we couldn't manage to find the whole time, but still sort of make, make the most out of like, out of a, uh, maybe tougher field situation, but it's, it's hard to be too upset when you're in the like nice warm weather of Puerto Rico for a couple weeks during December, living in New York at the time. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. And thanks everyone for these incredible stories. So a lot of you mentioned in your introductions some mentors that have been key aspects of your career trajectory. And I wanna ask how mentors have encouraged or supported you being in field work or in your subject of discipline. So I'd like to start with Lisa. Sure, well, mentors have, have been so key in my career and I enjoyed hearing the extent to which mentors were mentioned also by the other presenters. And when I initially was able to intern at the USGS, you know, I hadn't met any female earth scientists before uh, my USGS experience. And even that was unusual because women were so rare within the US Geological Survey at that time, but I happened to have uh, several female mentors that were really important in my career, but they also came from the school of mentoring that's very tough love, you know, because initially I thought, well, they're gonna give me a break a little because they must know it's a struggle, you know, trying to combat all these stereotypes and everything. But the, it, the uh, story I shared about Alaska, that field party was actually led by a woman, but she never let up on me. And it was always, you know, just constant challenging me both physically in the field uh, and then with my uh, base of knowledge, which of course I'm grateful for today because the challenge of just, you know, overcoming what might be some difficult points in one's training, you feel, you know, totally empowered after that. I should also mention that um, my parents have been terrific mentors and role models too. And they met at San Francisco State in the 1950s. And then my father, my late father, uh, went on to uh, become a faculty member at SF State and then also Dean of Undergraduate Studies during the 68, 69 campus strike. And so students at SF State led by students of color that were demanding, you know, curriculum and programs that reflected their life experience. And so it was a um, result of that strike that led to the College of Ethnic Studies at SF State, plus ethnic studies programs and departments across the country. But I mentioned that because as a kid, you know, I saw that happening. I saw my father whose field is black psychology, uh, the role that he played in just trying to broker um, you know, decisions between the administration and students. And I, and I thought that it was just common for everybody to be an activist, to want to really lead change. And I always wondered in my discipline that's so far removed from my parents, how I might embody that sense of you make change. And so that kind of mentorship from my parents that was rooted in social justice and activism, you know, I certainly try to incorporate in the diversity programs that I run, um, not only at the museum, but in partnership with other geoscientists. Yeah, thank you. It's really important to see people that resemble you in spaces you wanna occupy. And Robin, you also mentioned this in your introduction about having representation in your mentors. You wanna speak on that a little bit more about how those mentors have helped you? Yeah, so I would say the representation for me came from my informal, informal uh, mentors. Um, my uh, direct uh, science and research mentors, all white males. Um, and, you know, that's something we often, you know, we joke about. Um, but uh, in the grand scheme of things, these have been uh, mentors who acknowledge the spaces of privileges that they hold and leverage the social capital that they have to, you know, advance my career. And I think when it comes down to it, you know, that 
that is a huge component of being a mentor is using your social capital to help those that you're, uh, you're mentoring yourself. Um, I'll say to you know, my informal mentors who many of them were from the community college that I previously attended, um, they did not let up on me, uh, similar to Lisa's story. Like, um, you know, it, it wasn't that, you know, they made me feel like I had to move in these spaces like a martyr or something, uh, but they, they would remind me that, you know, I have so many wonderful opportunities in front of me and it would not only be a waste, but a disservice to uh, our communities to step away and not take up that responsibility. Um, and not just our communities of, uh, of color, you know, when, uh, you know, being black, Latinx, indigenous or Asian folks, uh, but the broader science community, because we all have something uh, great to contribute. Um, you know, I'm, you're hearing from the other panelists here, like all the amazing things that they're doing. Like I'm, I'm sitting here kind of jealous, like Jeff's over there doing dope things in the cemetery, Rob's over in Puerto Rico, Elisa's chilling with her mixtapes in Alaska, like, but, and, and I'm here getting stuck in the snow, calling my mentor, like, hey, can you get me out? Um, but, you know, you, and you see us all laughing right now on the screen because, you know, we're able to, to reflect on those good moments with our mentors who have helped us reach these spaces and reach the, these points uh, that have become meaningful for us. So, you know, I, I, I will say though, as I move forward and what my mentors have been encouraging me, both formal and informal, is that uh, not only do I need to hold space, but I need to create space. And I need to do my part in not just being a voice for my community, but allowing other voices to come to the decision-making table to influence policy that does directly impact us. And I'll just leave it on this uh, one brief point too, that um, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the, the level of care that my mentors have gone through to make sure that I was safe in the field um, because there are very specific things that um, people who become minoritized have to deal with. Um, you know, Jeff had mentioned earlier the, the concept of race and race is a social construct, but still it, um, you know, how we identify impacts, how we move in certain spaces. And there was a great article, you know, hopefully someone can link it in the chat for everyone about uh, serving uh, 10 step to serve and help uh, BIPOC scholars in the field when we're doing research. And I think that's a phenomenal resource that we should all check out. Yeah, thank you so much. And Jeff, the same question, how have mentors shaped you and how has that also impacted you as a mentor since you teach as well? So thanks for asking. And you know what I want to point out also with what Robin just mentioned is that I'm, I'm privileged to be here with all of you. You know, you all are well, way further than me in your education and like what you've done. So I'm just impressed to just be sitting here and talking with all of you that are here. Um, so for mentors, for me, kind of started going back. My, my story was a little bit different. When I went to, co I went to college straight from high school, um, showed my age, graduated in 93. And so I went to University of Cincinnati my freshman year. And at that time, I didn't really know what I was going to do. So I just chose liberal arts. And so we were from here, we're from Columbus, Ohio, but my dad, he retired from the post office. So they literally after my freshman year of college, they moved my parents to Pensacola, Florida, um, paid for them to get there. So, you know, you're not really gonna turn that down coming from Ohio and then you move to the beach in Florida working as, you know, so they moved. And at that point in time, my mom and my, my her youngest sister or aunt, they talk every day. So it was fine for me to stay with my aunt then, but I kind of, you know, I'm 19. I'm like, well, you are moving all the way to Florida. I can't, you know, I don't really want to just stay here and then come there to visit on the holidays. So I ended up moving to Pensacola with them after my freshman year. And also much like Robin, I, I ended up because we were out of state at the time. I went to a school called Pensacola Junior College, which is now Pensacola State College. So I went there for two years to be able to get um, in-state tuition at University of West Florida. So literally, I, you know, I, I was offered a scholarship to uh, be, a, be a, a teacher, a minority scholarship to become a teacher. And it was kind of just like um, Pensacola was really small in comparison to Columbus, Ohio, and just, just kind of tired of it. So after three years, you know, I decided because the, 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 they said that I, could, I would get this scholarship, they would help pay for my college. 
but I would have to stay there and teach for, I think, seven years or three years. And I just didn't want to do that. So I just literally up and left. Um, three years of college, just left, moved back to Columbus and started working for Columbus Public School System uh, for special ed. And at that time, I'd worked there for two years. And there's a, a, a really cool teacher named Miss Blackston, Julianne Blackston, um, who, you know, I was like, well, Miss Blackston, you know, I've done three years of college. I'm not really getting paid here the way I should be getting paid. I'm going to go back. So I think I might choose either English or archaeology. And I've always been interested in archaeology from ancient Egypt, ancient Greece as a kid. And so I literally moved back to, drove all my stuff back to Pensacola. I went into the, um, so she was my first mentor. She was, she was like, go, go do archaeology. It's not going to be too hard. Go do it. That's what you love. Go do it. But when I got there, I went down to the English department and English is great. Writing is great. But at the particular school was just very, it seemed very drab and like very boring in the department. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to go downstairs to the anthropology department. And it was in the basement and people were cool. And it was over from then. So at that point, to be perfectly honest, a lot of graduate students were my mentor. Uh, we didn't have a PhD program, but we had a uh, master's program in underwater archaeology and terrestrial. A lot of them, uh, my a professor, uh, Ms. Harris, uh, Dr. Phillips, John Phillips, uh, another guy, uh, Greg, um, that works for Pan American, a, a, a firm there. So a lot of people, just, just people taking you under your wing and just sort of um, it wasn't easy at all, but just understanding that I'm sure all of us were going to give it our all. And if we were going to get out of it, it was going to be because we decided that not someone else decided that for us. So just a lot of people, but, but, but the, the graduates that were, were teaching me like the total station, like the Jim Greens, and we're going to make sure you figure this out just because you have a bachelor's, you're not any less than us. So those are very integral people in, in my career path. Thank you. Yeah. And then finally, Rob, um, the same question, how have mentors shaped you and how has that impacted your mentoring? Well, I'll, I'll I guess, uh, name a couple of the mentors I had along the way. So my, um, during graduate school, the mentor um, that I had, uh, her name's Dr. Julie Lockwood, at, back at Rutgers on the East Coast. And, um, and with Mentorship in a in a PhD program, it's it's like five years or more. So you get to know these people really well and having a good mentor relationship in these in these graduate school programs is um, is really important and really amazing when it works out. And with Julia, I always felt like she cultivated this this um, sort of mentor mentee relationship where it was totally okay for me to ask questions when I didn't know something like some science subject, right? Like we're there to, we're there to get this, um, do this really like cutting edge research and come. So sometimes I think in my head, I was always like, I need to be, or like hope to be an expert on something. And I think a lot of people will tell you the further they get in like a graduate school program, the less maybe they feel like they know about things. Well, that's how I felt. I was like, by the end of five years, I was like, what do I know about ecology? I hope I got some good stuff. Like, so with, with her, I always felt like I, I could ask any question as basic as I thought it might have been. And then in turn, she would ask me questions and that just helped us both deepen our, deepen our knowledge about whatever we happen to be talking about. So that type of mentorship worked for me and I try to cultivate that with like my students um, when I work with them. And then another relation, uh, another mentor is like a, 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 like a peer, more like a peer mentor that Jeff was kind of talking about with these other um, graduate student teachers that I work with, with Clubes de Ciencias, like amazing scientists. And this program, this community organization pairs grad students from the US with grad students in Mexico to teach together for, for a week or two um, at different universities in Mexico. And so I've met a lot of co-teachers through that where I'm just like, oh my goodness, we can be total nerds about science and education and like talk about our backgrounds a little bit, just like that type of peer mentoring um, really, really like energizes me and keeps me doing this kind of work. Awesome, thank you all so much for all of those answers. And I think I've already learned a lot in between about where I can travel and that I also was gonna go back to Jeff and say that uh, there are differences between hills and mountains and that there are certain caught for that. So 
That was another thing that I learned today. But in our last three minutes, I kind of want to do a quick um, last question that we typically do for our panelists here is thinking about that back to when you were 17 or 18, what advice would you give to yourself as an inspiring young scholar, especially going into art sciences or thinking about the students today who are 17, 18, thinking about what's next? What in you know, 30 seconds to a minute answer um, advice would you give to those students? And I will start back with Robin to answer first. Yeah. Um, that's a that's a difficult one for me, partly because when I was 17 and 18, I was in and out of a lot of trouble. Um, growing up in an environment like mine in Richmond, California, I mean, survival was our priority. Um, and I, I will say though that in hindsight, um, I, could, I could look at it from a positive perspective and just say that uh, many of us come from situations or environments where we have to hustle or we have to know how to finesse our way through things. We have to know how to talk ourselves through situations or out of situations. And you know, my, my biggest advice is um, work on acknowledging some of those skills you already have that will take you very far. Um, you know, what some would consider soft skills like communication skills. Um, like I know uh, the ability to sweet talk my way out of uh, issues with law enforcement goes a long way in trying to adapt that to writing a grant proposal to fund my PhD. Um, you know, little things like that. Um, the hard skills, um, you know, things we do out in the field, you learn that as you go. Uh, don't sweat that too much. If you have interest and passion, someone's going to step in to mentor you and make sure you get, you have all the right tools and skill set to do so. Thank you, Robin. If we could do uh, Justin, Robin, uh, Lisa White will end with you. Yeah, thanks, guys. The six, if I was 17 or 18 again, honestly, I would say if I was, what I would say is stick with it. You know, if you, if you, honestly, if you didn't get through college through your first four years, stick with it. Um, as long as you stick with it, you're going to graduate. Uh, I would, you know, would, I would probably have had an easier pass, path if I would have just stuck with it. But um, there's something be, to be said for, you know, stick to itness, you know, for, for whatever that is that you're doing. So just, if you're, if you're interested in becoming an archaeologist, just get your history classes in. Um, always be willing to listen to somebody. You know, always hung around older people for the most part. And the reason why they allowed me to hang around with them is because I showed that I needed some answers from them. I, need, you know, I, I, was, I was willing to listen to what they had to tell me because they had more experience in that than me. So I would, I would absolutely say that. You know, any, any, any mentor that, that is taking their time to talk to you, or, or even if it's not a mentor, if they're trying to express something to you that can help your life, whether it's school or real life, you know, or the streets or college or wherever, listen to them, you know, make sure because if someone cares about you and you can tell like they want, they, they're really going to bat for me, then don't let that go. And, and don't disappoint them either. You know, don't, don't let them, you know, don't let them feel like what they're telling you is going in one ear and out the other. Bob. Um, I guess I would tell my 17, 18 year old self to sort of be bold. Like if, if I, if I seeing someone whose career, um, or like if I see someone whose career I, I could aspire to or might want, um, there's no, no harm in like re trying to reach out to them and introduce yourself to them. I think it's, yeah, making those connections early or just send in an email and the worst they could do is maybe say no but a good thing that could happen is they can help you out down the road introduce you to opportunities and it may seem a little like strange to just send an email out of the blue to someone whose research or work you think is really cool but that's how I that's how I found my graduate school opportunities or other work opportunities so I'd say be bold and go for it and Try to have like fun along the way too. I have to say that. Dr. White. Great. Well, I'd say that um, 
you know, it's, it's okay to change your mind and not know exactly what you want to do when you're 17 or 18. You know, I realize that the pressure is on and you all are growing up in a time where you are expected to, you know, declare a major when you're applying to college or set your college choices by exactly what, you know, you may want to study. And you just don't know sometimes you have an opportunity for an internship or, you know, you, you meet an individual where you're totally blown away by what they do. And maybe that's something you wanna do instead, you decide, even if you mostly prepared for this other career. So while there are some fundamental things that are important to do in high school around math and science courses that set one up you know, for uh, the ability to you know, enter into a, a science degree program, uh, you wanna just leave yourself a little bit of room because you never know what might inspire you or what other field as you learn about it uh, may you know, make you want to involve that. So I just found that you know, my 17 year old self, I wanted to be an artist, you know, a photographer and science wasn't really on my mind. I was always fascinated by it. And growing up in San Francisco, I grew up near a museum and always really enjoyed exhibits, but I didn't associate that with a career. And it took you know, taking classes to find out about this career. And that is what happens to a lot of earth scientists. It's often a discovery field because we don't really know and didn't get opportunities to experience it at the high school level. And so we're maybe motivated a little later than most people, than most scientists, but it all seems to work out. So I think just give yourself a little bit of room and freedom to you know, change your mind if you decide you like something else. Um, thank you, and thanks to all of our panelists today. I'm sure we could have probably talked two or three more hours, honestly, um, but we're going to stop for now. I'm going to put in the chat box the link in which you'll be able to find this career talk um, once we download it and, and, and are able to put it on YouTube and link it there. Um, but thank you again to everyone for taking the time to speak with us today. I greatly enjoyed it. Um, as always, of talking to people about their different careers. And I hope this isn't the last time that we all get together. Um, but thank you for your time. And thank you to everybody that sat on for this past hour and listened. Um, and enjoy your weekend. Thank you very much. Everybody enjoy their weekend. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Nice to meet everybody.